This evening we're returning to Luke's uh, gospel and um, you know each of the gospels has its uh, various challenges. I would say Matthew and Mark to me at least tend to be easier to understand. John was probably uh, even though it's written the most simply it's also the most obscure. Uh, Luke's gospel I think because of Luke's mind it, as I w was talking about in the, uh, the new members class this morning as we're considering the Bible, it reflects the, uh, the human author as well as, of course, the divine author behind it. We see something of Luke's um, way of thinking and his uh, more exalted vocabulary. It's not always easy to understand uh, what, what he is saying, but he does include things in this gospel that we don't see in the other gospels, and um, certainly what we saw this morning was, was one of those things. Um, but let's take a look at uh, verses 14 through 18. Luke 16, verses 14 through 18. Again, this is the reaction of the Pharisees to what Jesus, we saw Jesus telling his disciples uh, earlier this morning. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom has been preached and everyone is forcing his way into it, but it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. I think I said through verse 18, but I really want to stop in verse uh, 17 because the next, the next verse is really a whole subject in and of itself. Now, it's not difficult to understand what Luke is saying here, but it is difficult to see how they, these things uh, tie together. Jesus is using this as a rebuke uh, against the Pharisees for their attitude toward what it was he just said. Now, as I've mentioned, this morning we were looking at Jesus' lesson to his disciples on stewardship, and this evening we see what the Pharisees had to think about that. Luke tells us that they were listening to Jesus. They had heard what he said, and here's my opportunity to review what he said, about how what, everything that they had really didn't belong to them, but it was something that belonged to God. And that God had entrusted these things to them to use for his profit and for his glory. How they were to use, um, well, basically to glorify him by using what it is they did have to help others. And how this stewardship served to test the condition of their hearts because faithfulness uh, was really a test of genuine religion. When the Lord uh, gives to us His Holy Spirit, as we read in Galatians chapter 5, one of the fruits of the Spirit is faithfulness, which means the Spirit of God gives us the grace we need to take what the Lord has given to us and to use it for His glory. I believe Jesus was specifically putting His finger on material wealth, how we use the things that we have, that we're not simply to use it on ourselves, that God didn't give it just for us, but He also gave it to us in order to help others. This is one of the ways in which uh, Jesus uses us to uh, extend the kingdom of heaven is by reflecting his character. Again, think about the life of Jesus and how he lived while he was in this world. His entire ministry was giving himself to others and using what he had to serve them. Jesus simply wants us uh, to do the same. Well, what do the Pharisees think uh, about this? Obviously, they didn't agree with Jesus particularly what he said last, which is that they could not serve God and money. They believed that they could do both. And so they did what everyone tends to do when they don't like something the Bible says. They began to run down the messenger by scoffing or ridiculing his message. The Pharisees, as we already saw, loved money and they weren't about to give it away. You realize that the reason why the Pharisees ultimately handed Jesus over to the Romans was because they didn't want to lose their position with Rome and their, the potential of making more wealth. They loved their affluence, they loved their authority, and they loved their money and they'd rather get rid of Jesus than get rid of their wealth. 
what Jeremiah wrote regarding Judah in his day was certainly equally could be applied to them in Jeremiah 6.10. He says, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are closed and they cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord has become a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. Now, here's uh, one of the things we should first of all take, uh, take warning that we don't find uh, within ourselves because this is really one of the, the, uh, the fruits of the flesh, resistance to God's word. And even as believers, with the help of God's Holy Spirit, we can find ourselves, as um, again I mentioned this morning and I heard recently in a sermon, I think it's very true, we can find ourselves picking and choosing uh, what we'll accept and what we won't accept from the Bible, right? Jesus, or I should say James, Jesus through James, warns us that we must never become judges of the word. We have no right to judge God. We don't stand over him. He is the Lord and we are his servants. Uh, the only right response for us is simply to listen to what the Lord says and submit to what he says. Remember what I also mentioned this morning, and I'm talking about in, in the, the class that we had out in the por portable a wise Puritan, if I can remember his name, I would uh, certainly let you know who it was, once said this, and I think it was Thomas Shepard, that we can't embrace any one part of God's word unless we are willing to embrace all of God's word. We have to own it all. You know, we love to embrace the promises. We love to believe that those things apply to us, uh, eternal life, the fact that God's going to work everything together for our good, uh, that our eternity is secure. Um, but unless we're willing to embrace everything, including the commandments, including submission, including the stewardship that the Lord has given to us, uh, we really can't apply the promises to us. And let me just simply say that if we do have the Spirit of God working within us, we know that our desire is to embrace everything that the Lord gives us. One thing we always need to guard against is He's not giving us a recipe on how to be saved. That was the error the Pharisees made. He's simply telling us what we're going to find in our lives if the Spirit of God dwells in us. And this is what we're going to find, a desire to embrace all that God says. Now, Jesus could not let this reaction go unanswered. Uh, he's always seeking to do good to his audience, even to the Pharisees, and particularly those who were listening, such as his disciples. And so he goes on now to expose their hypocrisy. He begins by pointing out to, to the Pharisees, and again, he's, he's reproving them, rebuking them, but that's not always a bad thing, is it? We need to be reproved from time to time, and especially the Pharisees, because they didn't know the Lord for the most part. But he begins pointing out to them that they might be able to fool men, which is really what they were after, with their pretense to holiness and piety, but they really can't fool God. God knows what's behind what they're doing. He says in verse 15, And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men. But God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. As you know, the Pharisees were very much for making a show. They were concerned so much about what other people thought about them that uh, they wanted to make sure that they put on a good show that, so that the people would applaud them, thinking or make them, making them think that they were more holy and more righteous so that they would look up to them as leaders and teachers and role models. Somehow, the Pharisees seemed to think that if the people thought well of them, that God also approved of them. But obviously, that, that wasn't the case. Now, that is the problem of using what other people think and what other people do as our standard rather than um, using God's words. And I think that's something else that we may tend to fall into, but we need to avoid. I mean, don't we find ourselves sometimes thinking this way? How do I know whether what I want to do is right or wrong? Well, what do I see other believers doing? Do I see them doing this thing? If so, it gives to me perhaps a reason to do it. And by the way, um, 
the Bible does warn us against giving bad examples uh, to other people. We need to make sure that uh, we understand that our example uh, influences other people, which is why our example always needs to encourage them. Uh, we tend to look around and see what other believers are doing to determine whether what we want to do is right rather than simply reading the Word of God to see what He has to say. Uh, this is really that logical fallacy. If you haven't studied logical fallacies, it really is an interesting subject. But this is the, the one that's called the argumentum ad populum or the argument from popular opinion where I go out and I count heads to determine truth rather than going to the source of truth. I mean, after all, can, can a thousand people, can a hundred thousand, can a million people who believe something, can they be wrong? Well, of course they can be wrong, right? And most often they are if, if they're not following the Lord. The largest segment of the historic Christian church, if I can name names, the Roman Catholic Church, believes, as we know quite well from all of our Reformation series, that we need to contribute to our salvation, to our justification, through works of satisfaction. There are over 1.2 billion members of, of the Roman Catholic Church throughout the world who presumably accept this teaching that's a large portion of the world's population, but does that make it right because so many people believe it? Obviously not when God tells us that it's otherwise. Well, the Pharisees were doing something similar here when they thought that God approved of them because the people approved of them, because they were able to pull the wool over their eyes. Somehow they thought they could do the same uh, with God. We need to understand we're not going to be examined. We're not going to be evaluated. We're not going to be judged uh, on that final day by what others think, but rather by what God thinks of us. And I think that was the motivation behind the martyrs, wasn't it? Such as Athanasius, although I believe Athanasius actually died of old age, but there was a host of others through church history who stood on the truth Rather than standing on popular opinion, and the name Athanasius, of course, rises to the surface because Athanasius was someone who was willing to hold to the truth of the Trinity, even though virtually the rest of the church, not everyone, thankfully, but a large portion of the church actually turned against that thinking. And in the process of his defending that doctrine, he was deposed and exiled five times from his office from his country, from his livelihood, and had to suffer a great deal because he was willing to stand on the truth. And as a matter of fact, throughout church history, we find that there was a host of others who would, would rather do that than cave into popular opinion, even if it meant they would have to give their lives. Jesus says to the Pharisees, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. God knows what you're doing, and he knows why you're doing it. He knew that they were doing the things they were doing simply to gain the people's approval rather than his. Well, the point is, God knows everything, right? He knows what we're doing. He knows why we're doing it. That's why when Solomon took office as king, David warned him in 1 Chronicles 28, 9. As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thoughts. We can't hide anything from God. He's looking for the motive behind everything that we do and certainly, as we know, he is looking for those who love him with a whole heart. The eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the world, seeking to basically to support those whose heart is completely his. God knows our hearts. He knows whether we're sincere or whether we're just simply keeping up appearances so that others will think well of us which is why we need to strive to make sure that we are serving him in sincerity with a whole heart and whole mind, why we need to put off sinful desires, as we saw this morning, 
and devote ourselves completely to him because that is what true religion is. That's what the Spirit of God works in our hearts versus what we see, of course, in these religious leaders. And we should do this especially considering that what the Pharisees were doing, Jesus said in God's eyes is detestable. It makes him sick. Well, Jesus then went on to reprove them for their unwillingness to let go of the old covenant and to embrace the new. I think that's what he has in mind here in verse 16. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom has been preached and everyone is forcing his way into it. That is everyone but them, right? Well, the law and the prophets are simply the old covenant religion, right? So that was the religion God gave to Israel. It was their religion. At least they believed it was their religion. Uh, we know they misunderstood the message of the Old Testament, which is the just shall live by faith. They turned the grace of God into a series of works so that they might justify themselves. But being the teachers of the Old Covenant, they believed that they had a monopoly on salvation. They thought they were the ones who held the truth, and they were the ones who would open the door of the kingdom to others by teaching them this truth. But obviously they were wrong. Remember our Lord Jesus on another occasion said, You've thrown away the key of knowledge. You will not enter into the kingdom of heaven, nor will you allow anyone else to enter. That was the seriousness of their false religion. Now, John Gill suggests that their attachment to the old covenant, you know, which are basically types and shadows of the things that were coming in the gospel era, may have been how they justified their pursuit of money. I think that was kind of an interesting point, isn't it? Because uh, after all, when you look back at the Old Testament, you look at the patriarchs, you look at the great kings, you look at Abraham, you look at David, you look at Solomon, what was true of these men? Uh, well, these were godly men for the most part, Solomon at least early on, but they were extremely wealthy. It seems like God blesses those who follow him with great wealth. And then when you consider the tabernacle and the temple, wasn't it just decked out with all kinds of gold and silver and precious stones? Didn't God seem to have some kind of an interest in wealth? You know, it is interesting when the health and wealth preachers today want to prove that God intends for us to be rich, that they more often than not point to those things in the Old Testament, don't they, rather than pointing to the new. But when they do that, they fail to understand that all this wealth of the Old Testament was really just a concrete picture of the glory of the spiritual realities that were ahead in the New Covenant. You know, the, the gold and the jewels, which are also used to describe heaven. You know, do we think that, that heaven is precious because it has precious metals and stones in it? Those things mean nothing to God. They're simply a picture of the spiritual glory. You know, it's in terms of things perhaps we can... We can understand a bit better because, you know, how can we understand the glories of heaven? We only have just a small taste, just a foretaste of what it's like through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. And that little taste is enough to make us pursue it with, with all of our hearts. Not to mention the fact, of course, that when you look at the Old Testament, not everybody in, in that was, was rich. There was just a select few. And, you know, it's interesting that the select few that tended to be very wealthy were those who in some way were types of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one, though, as we see in the New Covenant, who gives up the riches of heaven and becomes poor in order to make us rich, but not rich in a necessarily material way, but rather in a spiritual way. I think we would be hard-pressed to find many rich in the New Covenant. I don't know if you've ever tried it, but... We know specifically, Paul says, there haven't been many mighty, not many noble, not many rich that the Lord calls into the kingdom. What we find instead is that God chooses the poor to be rich in faith, that they might inherit the riches of heaven. As I mentioned this morning, God's not opposed to money. He does give us money to use. He takes care of our needs, but he also cautions us against the love of money uh, that is the root of all sorts of evil and not being possessed by our possessions, but being willing to let them go if we need to for his use and his glory. But again, 
the reality and the new covenant has come. Jesus has come from the time that John the Baptist arrived on the scene. The gospel was being preached. The good news of forgiveness and righteousness that God freely gives through his son apart from the works of the law. The shadows were all passing away. It would be another 40 years before they would pass away completely, before 70 AD comes and the Lord destroys the temple, the amount of time that it would take for uh, basically the evangelists, the apostles to be able to get out and to preach the gospel to the Jews, to the far corners of the Roman Empire. But they were passing away. They would be torn down. And now Jesus says, Everyone is forcing their way into that kingdom. The common, uneducated people that the that Pharisees despised. The tax collectors and the sinners that they also despised. The hated Samaritans and even the Gentiles. Even during the time of Jesus' ministry, there were Gentiles, you know, that were coming to Christ and being saved, foreshadowing the salvation he would bring to the Gentiles. The only ones who weren't doing this were the Pharisees. They were too prideful. Salvation had to be on their terms. They were too greedy. They loved their money and their position too much to receive Jesus. Again, remember what we saw this morning. We cannot have two masters. We can't love Jesus and money. We can't serve them both. True religion, Jesus is telling us, is loving him the most, putting him First, let's not forget what Jesus said earlier in Luke's gospel, some of the most radical things that he has to say uh, in the scriptures and some of the most challenging to kind of wrap our minds around, but particularly to put on, to live. He says in Luke 14, verses 26 through 27, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And again, I'll remind you that Jesus is not telling us here, obviously, we need to hate anyone. But what he's saying is that our love for him must be greater, so much greater than those we love the most in this world that by comparison, it looks like hatred, that we'd be willing to, as it were, put them off in order that we might serve the Lord and then he says in verse 33 of that same chapter, so then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Now, we understand what that means as well. Um, we need to understand that what we have belongs to the Lord, and we are willing to, of course, see it in that way and use what we have in that way to be his stewards and to be faithful with it doesn't mean in every case that we get rid of everything, sell it, and give it to the poor and follow Jesus. In today's world, it, it can mean that, I suppose, on some occasions, but most often it means we and all that belongs to us belongs to him. We cannot follow him. We cannot serve him unless we die to ourselves and pick up our crosses, follow after him, and give everything that we have to him. That is true religion. Not holding on, again, to wealth, not holding on to glory and affluence and, and our lives, but rather giving it all up to the Lord, which is what Jesus calls us to do in the new covenant. Now, finally, so that they didn't misunderstand, Jesus reminds them that even though the gospel of God's grace, free grace is being proclaimed, salvation apart from works, okay, that doesn't mean that the law is no longer Important. It doesn't mean that it's no longer valid. Now, certainly, when Jesus dies, that puts an end to the ceremonial law. And when the state or nation of Israel ceases to be a people, that puts an end to the civil law. But it doesn't put an end to the moral law. The moral law is still in effect, and that's what I believe Jesus is referring to when he says in verse 17. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. I think Jesus here is challenging the Pharisees, first of all, saying that if you want to be justified by the law, remember the standard that you need to reach to justify yourselves in God's eyes is just as high now 
as it has always been. You must be perfect in order to enter into heaven. And if you can't reach perfection, you will remain under the curse, as we read in our uh, meditation this evening. Now, that's the problem, isn't it, with uh, a salvation based upon works, is that you must be perfect. And we can't be perfect. We cannot be good enough in and of ourselves. Uh, we, you know, not only is there the matter of Adam's guilt that we come into the world with, which we have no way to get rid of on our own. I mean, no amount of work that we could possibly do would ever make up for that guilt. We can't pay God back an infinite debt. But there's also all the other sins we've committed and continue to commit as we go through life. And the corrupt heart that these sinful things actually come out of, the corrupt heart that we inherited that leaves us helpless to keep God's law. And again, that's why I would remind you again, Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians 3.10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. Why? For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them or to do them. If you don't do them all, you're going to remain under the curse. And you know, the fact is that even if we started now, let's say we're unconverted and we started now somehow to keep the law, that still wouldn't save us because we're still guilty of so much. The only way this standard can be reached is by trusting the one who actually did this. And that, of course, is Jesus. And that is true religion. Again, Jesus is telling them, pointing them again to the law, saying, read the law again, and you'll see that you don't measure up. You need to come to me. Now, this reminds us, I should say, secondly, that even though, even though uh, through the gospel we are saved by grace alone, received by faith alone, we need to understand as well that the standard by which we are to live still hasn't changed. God gave us the law initially to show us, well, I think initially in the garden, of course, as a rule of love to show us how to love him and how to love those that would come into the world, how Adam should love his wife and how she should love him and how they as parents should love their children. It was written on their hearts originally. But then, of course, as it's reintroduced into a world that's already fallen into sin, God intended that law to show his people and to show us just how far short we fall of the standard that God requires for us to enter into heaven in order that it might point us to his son for our salvation. Uh, the one thing that evangelical believers today tend to miss is the fact that having come to Jesus and having been justified by him, he points us back to the law. By the way, this is a quote from John Stott. I wouldn't necessarily believe everything that he says, uh, at least in uh, the course of his writings, but he was certainly right here that he points us back to the law, both by way of his own personal example, Jesus lived according to the law, but also by way of command to teach us how to love and to please him. And you know, he didn't say, go and justify yourselves, that he justifies us and he gives us his Holy Spirit so that we might now keep the law, so that we might become like him. So the bottom line is essentially this, the Lord is not interested in external religion. He's not interested in a facade, a show that's meant simply to impress other people. The Lord is interested in true religion, a religion that is internal, a sincere religion of the heart that is motivated by love, the love which the Spirit of God gives that puts his kingdom first, that comes through faith in him. That is really what Religion is all about true religion. So again, we see by way of negative example what the Lord really desires of us. And again, he's given us, as we saw this morning with regard to um, the fact that he's made us stewards and we are to use the things he has given to us for his glory. We're reminded again this evening that what he's given us here is not a recipe on how to justify ourselves or save ourselves, but rather he's telling us what the Spirit of God actually does within us. He takes away the facade of religion and gives to us a true religion, one that works from the inside out. Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees on one occasion? He says, 
you're like white, whitewashed sepulchers. You, know, you appear beautiful on the outside, but inside you're full of corruption. Take and clean the inside first, and then the outside will become beautiful. That's what the Lord does in the new covenant. He cleans out the inside by his Holy Spirit, and that works its way to the outside. We begin to live in a way that is honoring to him. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, um, let's ask the Lord to uh, encourage us and strengthen us in, in our resolve to live the kind of life he calls us to live and to grow into his image.